Patients with head and neck cancer are often treated with therapeutic radiation to the neck. After this, there are some expected radiologic findings that should not be confused for recurrent tumor. There are also complications of that therapeutic radiation that the radiologist should be on the lookout for. The expected findings that we see on CT of the neck after irradiation are thickening of the platysma, fat stranding, increased density of the submandibular glands, and laryngeal edema. It's important to also watch out for occasional findings such as enlargement of benign cysts and increased enhancement of benign nodes. Obviously, that can be easily mistaken for recurrent cancer within the nodes. To demonstrate the expected findings after therapeutic radiation, I've intentionally chosen a patient who has received unilateral radiation. This side of the neck is still normal. This side is irradiated, so it makes for a nice comparison. First, let's look at the platysma muscle. Look how much thicker the platysma muscle is on the side that's been irradiated. On this side, still a thin line as if drawn by a pencil, much thicker on the contralateral side. Look at the subcutaneous and deep fat within the neck. So much infiltration on this side, you might think this was cellulitis, but this is an expected finding after radiation. Now let's look at the submandibular gland. This is what it's supposed to look like on this side. On this side, the gland is enlarged, it's abnormally enhancing, and you can start to see some non-enhancing septations throughout the gland. This is expected finding after radiation. You should note that it's not only increased enhancement within this gland, there's also increased intrinsic density that can be seen on unenhanced images. Let's have a look at the epiglottis. Now here the whole epiglottis is affected, so it's a little hard to use the unilateral asymmetry to our advantage, but look how thick this epiglottis is. The epiglottis should be another pencil drawn line, only a couple millimeters thick. This thing is three or four times the expected, dis uh, uh, expected thickness of the epiglottis. Again, that's expected after radiation. Don't confuse these findings with recurrent cancer. It's not just the epiglottis that becomes thickened after radiation. All of the walls, all of the mucosal surfaces of the larynx have become thickened as though they had recurrent cancer in them. The way you distinguish this from recurrent cancer is with enhancement. This is a dull, non-enhancing thickening of the mucosal and submucosal tissues. When we see recurrence, it tends to be focal, and it tends to be rounded, and it tends to be enhancing. None of those is true in these post-radiation thickening. This is the most common area for radiologists to incorrectly call recurrent tumor, especially after a laryngeal carcinoma. Now, the pharynx mucosa can do something very similar to this, but in the pharynx, it's limited. It only lasts a few weeks and then goes back to normal. In the larynx, it persists indefinitely. Here's a patient who was previously treated for head and neck cancer, and oh no, there's a necrotic mass sitting right in front of the larynx. That's really concerning for recurrent disease. Well, before we get too excited, let's go back and look what that area looked like before the radiation. Here's the patient's imaging pre-op. Now, this wasn't called anything on the pre-op imaging. I think it was interpreted as just part of the strap muscles. But in retrospect, what we're looking at here is actually a thyroglossal duct cyst, and it's uh, extending through the thyrohyoid membrane, as these often do. You can see how much larger it got after radiation. In addition to all the other findings that we had already talked about, there is enlargement of this thyroglossal duct cyst. That is an unsurprising finding after radiation and should not be interpreted as recurrent tumor. Go back and look at the preoperative images, see if there was already something there that just got bigger. Uh, this is really concerning. This patient actually had a base of tongue cancer. So in seeing this rim enhancing mass deep in the tongue there, you can imagine how concerned we got. Once again, we went back to the preoperative imaging. So on preoperative imaging, first of all, here is the primary tumor. Is this close enough to where that primary tumor was to, for me to be worried? How worried do I have to be? Well, once you recognize that this is in an ideal location 
for a thyroglossal duct cyst within the tongue at the foramen cecum. It's a classic location. This lobulated appearance, the rim enhancement, is because of the radiation. And this is actually about a centimeter away of where, from where a recurrent tumor would be out here in the lateral oropharynx. This is a thyroglossal duct cyst. It was so small, it wasn't even perceptible prior to radiation. The radiation brought it out and made it visible and expected finding after radiation. Here's another patient who had treated head and neck cancer. You can see the large node in level three here. It went away entirely, beautiful response to therapy, but it got replaced by this larger mass here. What's going on? Well, if we look back, there was something going on here. There was a smaller lesion here in that exact location, partly filled with fluid, partly filled with gas. This is a small laryngocele. Now it's a big laryngocele. We talk about how concerning laryngoceles are when they are seen and the patient doesn't have a history that would support the formation of a laryngoceles. What we're talking about is something like radiation or surgery to the larynx. That's what we mean by a history that supports formation of a laryngoceles because radiation is one of the things that can cause a laryngoceles to form or to enlarge as in this patient. Here's another patient who received therapeutic radiation for head and neck cancer. Look at this lymph node in the submandibular triangle and this lymph node in level two. They are enhancing way too much. We know that enhancement is one of the features that distinguishes malignant nodes from benign nodes, so that's worrisome. This happened to be a PET CT, and you can see that there is actually FDG avidity within these enhancing nodes. Very concerning appearance. But let's go back to the preoperative imaging. Well, those nodes were there. They were much smaller on the preoperative imaging. So does that make me more concerned or less concerned? Well, what you probably noticed was that there's actually a large necrotic node on the other side. These are contralateral nodes from a unilateral cancer of the tonsil. There's no reason why we should get nodes on this side of the neck. These nodes are becoming more enhancing and more FDG avid as a response to radiation. How do we know that that's what's going on? Look at the configuration of these nodes. They are still elongated. They still have a reniform configuration. That's very reassuring. Don't be fooled by nodes that become more enhancing in response to radiation. This is an acceptable finding after radiation. Now, if you're not sure, if you're still a little concerned, you can give this a NIRADS-2 and follow, give it close clinical follow-up and radiologic follow-up uh, if you're not comfortable calling it completely normal. But don't suggest that anyone goes in and biopsies these. This is an expected response to radiation. Not all of the findings after your therapeutic radiation are benign. There are also complications of therapeutic radiation, including osteoradionecrosis, osteomyelitis, chondroradionecrosis, we're talking about the laryngeal cartilages there, and soft tissue ulceration. You can imagine how concerning that is because the other thing that causes soft tissue ulceration is recurrent cancer. This is the classic appearance of osteoradionecrosis. There is irregular, ratty erosion of the bone. There's interruptions in the cortical surface. This is a classic appearance for osteoradionecrosis. Here's another patient with classic findings of osteoradionecrosis. Look at the interruption in the cortical surface. Look at the loss of trabeculae within the bone. And also the gas here, another clue that we might be dealing with osteoradionecrosis. This examination happened to be a PET CT, and you can see that there is no discernible FDG uptake at the site of the osteoradionecrosis. That's exactly what you'd expect. This is dead bone. There's no reason why necrotic bone should have an increase in FDG avidity. There's no living cells there to take up the FDG. So why is it then that we often see increased FDG avidity in association with osteoradionecrosis on PET-CT? 
The answer is that osteoradionecrosis and osteomyelitis often coexist. Each of those two entities makes the other one more likely. And so as frequently as not, we see both osteoradionecrosis and osteomyelitis. Take this patient, for example. Classic findings of osteoradionecrosis, interruption of the cortical um, surface there, and destruction, erosion of the trabecular pattern within the bone itself. But there's one other finding here. There is periosteal reaction, new bone formation. Uh, this is a Codman triangle and a classic finding of osteomyelitis. And in fact, this is coexistent osteoradionecrosis and osteomyelitis. When these things show up together, that's when that inflammatory response causes increased FDG avidity on a PET CT. Happens all the time. How about this case here? Look at these findings. There's an interruption in the cortical surface. There is interruption of the underlying trabeculae. This looks a lot like everything else we've been talking about. Unfortunately, this is recurrent tumor at the site of a prior resection. That's concerning. This brings up one of the classic dilemmas in head and neck imaging. How do you interpret mandibular erosions after radiation? There are three possibilities. Osteoradionecrosis, osteomyelitis, and recurrent tumor. When you see erosions, how can you tell these apart? Well, as the last few cases should demonstrate, it's often impossible to tell them apart, especially since osteomyelitis and osteoradionecrosis can occur simultaneously. Sometimes you'll encounter a soft tissue mass in a recurrent tumor, and that can be helpful. But this is a classic conundrum in radiology. It's not easy to tell these three apart. Okay, back to our discussion of the complications of radiation. It's not just the mandible that succumbs to, to osteoradionecrosis. The hyoid bone is in the middle of all this radiation as well, and you can see similar findings here. There's an interruption in the bone. There is ratty, irregular erosion and replacement with necrotic soft tissue where that hyoid bone should be. Notice also that there's some gas within the bone itself. That's another important finding of osteoradionecrosis in the hyoid bone. Even if all you see is that gas forming within the hyoid bone itself, that's still enough to suggest osteoradionecrosis, even if you don't see the classic erosions of the cortex and the trabeculae. I would call that osteoradionecrosis of the hyoid bone. It's not just bones that can be affected by radionecrosis. Cartilage can as well. This is chondroradionecrosis. Look at this nice, normal arretinoid cartilage. Now look on this side how the cartilage has been replaced with gas bubbles and ratty erosion. It's even extended a little bit into the cricoid cartilage right there. Chondroradionecrosis, same basic process as osteoradionecrosis, just in the cartilages. The other type of tissue that can succumb to radiation are the soft tissues. You'd expect the normal contour of the posterior oropharynx to be a nice smooth line like this. Instead, there is this big pocket that is extending from the expected mucosal surface back into the retropharyngeal soft tissues. This is an, a soft tissue ulceration. Now, how do I know this is from radiation and not ulceration in the center of a recurrent tumor? Well, I'm not seeing the enhancing tissue all the way around that I would expect to see. This actually is a smooth mucosal surface, even though it's ulcerated. Those are some of the clues that we're dealing with necrosis of the soft tissue from prior radiation and not recurrent tumor that has become ulcerated. But again, a classic radiologic dilemma. Just to review what we've talked about, there are several expected findings after therapeutic radiation of the neck. You almost always see thickening of the platysma, stranding of the subcutaneous and deep fat, dense and hyper-enhancing submandibular glands, and edema of the laryngeal mucosal surfaces. But it's also important to watch out for enlargement of benign cysts like thyroglossal duct cysts or laryngocele's and enhancement of benign nodes that is easy to mistake for new metastatic disease.
Remember also the potential complications from prior radiation, such as osteoradionecrosis and osteomyelitis, which frequently occur simultaneously, chondroradionecrosis, and even soft tissue ulceration. Remember also this classic differential diagnosis in patients who have been treated with radiation for cancer of the oral cavity. Osteoradionecrosis, osteomyelitis, and recurrent tumor can all look exactly the same with erosions of the cortical surface of the mandible and the trabeculae. Little clues may be present, like soft tissue mass in recurrent tumor or elevation of the periosteum in osteomyelitis, but this is a tough differential. And that concludes this brief lecture on the radiologic findings in the neck on patients who have received therapeutic radiation.